Okay, I put here that uh, there's messages from the magmatism. But from my perspective, it's more than messages. A lot of the whole story comes from the magmatism. Because when you look at it, uh, the magmas are really special. They, they form in the mantle. They traverse the whole crust. They, they bring a signal, if we can decipher it, all the way from the mantle through the crust. And not only that, they give us time. So uh, the, the mag magmatism is really important. And sometimes I think it's uh, overlooked. OK, so um, I wanted to give just a little bit of background on the Andes in terms of the magmatism. People generally talk about uh, four volcanic zones, the northern volcanic zone in the south, the central volcanic zone in the center, the southern volcanic zone uh, in the southern Andes, and then in the far south we have the Austral volcanic zone. And these volcanic zones are separated by amagmatic gaps, which in the between the northern volcanic zone and the central volcanic zone corresponds with the Peruvian flat slab. And uh, the, between the central volcanic zone and the southern volcanic zone corresponds to what we used to know as the Chilean flat slab until Victor Ramos decided that it was unfair because the slab was flat in Chile, or in Argentina, not in Chile, and it should be the Pampean flat slab. So he is now on a campaign. And we have a bet how long it'll take to convert the world from saying Chile flat slab to Pampean. So to compromise, I put Chile Pampean. <laughs> but it's really making a mess of things. But uh, OK. And then we have uh, the other gap down here is a totally different type of gap. This is the associated with the uh, Chile triple junction. And I'm not going to talk about that. So this is a very different type of gap. I will be uh, talking in this talk mainly about the area in the box here, which corresponds. Ono actually uh, concentrated his talk mainly on the Altiplano, which is the flat plain. I will actually be talking more about the southern Altiplano, the Puna, extending down through the shallow subduction zone into uh, just south of the shallow subduction zone. So we'll be looking at uh, examples of magmatism um, through this whole area. This is a uh, topo topographic image. And uh, of course, the high areas are in red. Uh, this is Cerros Pompeianos out here, which are like the Laramide ranges over the Chilean flat slab. I will say Chilean flat slab. OK, just, just to uh, tell you some of my conclusions, and I don't know if I totally agree with Ono on everything, but uh, transient shallow or flat subduction has been a common feature in the Neogene Andes and possibly back to the Eocene. And this could be, a, and I think, is a major factor as to why the Andean mountain belt exists. And uh, the changes in the slab geometry are reflected in the magmatic rocks. So by looking at also the deformation, but really the magmatism, because the magmatism gives you time, and it brings these signals as to whether you have a slab signal or lower crustal signal. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. It brings that slab. So, so we, at least I, have tried to read the changes in a slab geometry out of the magmatism. And uh, pulses of mafic magmatism associated with decompression melting of the mantle under steepening slabs lead to back arc magmatic flare-ups. And uh, so this we'll talk about the ignimbrites in the Puna, but it's not only the ignimbrites in the Puna. We see uh, mafic lavas without uh, silicic lavas when we get in the southern Andes. OK, um, this is an important concept, I think. And uh, we, I think, started this in the Andes. And people told me we were crazy that uh, you couldn't remove the crust by making it into eclogite and dropping it off. And now it seems to be a household word. But anyway, thick crust, along with the underlying lithosphere, can founder into the mantle, delaminate. And I think the main time this is happening is as the slabs are steepening. So when you have a shallow slab, it's propping it up. When that slab steepens up, uh, you, that's when you get the principal delamination. We'll talk about that. And then. Um, we can look, as Ona was trying to do, a long strike um, at what's going on. And uh, so 
There are temporal magmatic similarities, and these are peaks in magmatism, and they occur from, I think people now recognize, from Colombia down to Patagonia, and uh, those have got to be controlled by some larger system than the Andes itself, and uh, the westward drift, the overriding of the Andes, I think, is uh, partly why we're seeing these long strike magmatic flare-ups or similarities. And then we see also you see long strike differences, and I'm going to argue that a lot of those differences are associated with changes in plate geometry, which to some order can be related to subduction of topographic features. And then the other thing is a big question of what's the mantle underneath the Andes. I mean, we've already talked a little bit about poor art crustal erosion. We've talked about delamination. And actually, the Andean margin is more a margin, it's a margin of destruction rather than creation. So, so we're destroying crust. And so where's that crust going? And that crust is disappearing in the system, and we have an enriched mantle. Yet there are people that argue that, uh, that we have to have a depleted mantle underneath the Andes, and I think we have an enriched mantle underneath the Andes. So, so we're going to talk about that, and that enrichment comes from this material being removed by delamination and poor arc subduction erosion, and a lot of this material being removed is actually going much further down, and uh, we're probably seeing it in the, ma in the uh, um, mantle hot spots in the Atlantic. Uh, they also have a often have a lower lithosphere type signature. So this stuff is being recycled into the mantle. There's a lot of stuff going down. And uh, it's amazing because I think that this is a concept. It's like delamination. You know, I, my husband, I think, has kept track of the uh, citations on delamination from when the first papers on crustal delamination were written in the early 90s. I mean, it just keeps growing. And four arc subduction erosion was very unpopular with the geochemical community, and all of a sudden it's starting to go up like this, and you're going to see a lot more on four arc subduction erosion. Okay, so um, I talked about the shallow subduction zones that exist today, the Chilean flat slab, the Peruvian flat slab. And if we go back and try and reconstruct from the magmatism and also the deformation, um, we people, including us, I guess we're probably prime among us, trying to recognize um, older shallow subduction zones. And uh, so in this talk, we're going to start by looking at the Chilean flat slab. Then we're going to go south, um, south of the Ch Chilean flat slab, where it seems there's been a transient period of shallow subduction. And we're going to try and read this out of the chemistry. And I call this the neo can basin flat slab, but Victor said that that was wrong. It should be Pagania. So now we have the same problem here. He calls it Pagania, and he's on a campaign to get the world to call it Pagania. You might explain that, Victor. Oh, yeah. Um, Victor Ramos is uh, a geologist at the University of Buenos Aires. He's the foremost geologist in South America. He was just elected to the North American Academy of Science. And uh, he probably knows as much about the Andes as anyone. And I've worked with him for years, and we all have. And he climbed Aconcagua. And he climbed Aconcagua, yes. Is it the highest peak in South America? No, it's the highest peak outside the Himalayas. But still, <laughs> but still the highest in South America. Yeah, it's still. <laughs> but McKinley's a dimple. OK, and the Sierras, forget it. OK, so and then um, we're going to talk about uh, David James and us, uh, and also some other people have talked about Oligocene, uh, shallow subduction underneath the Altiplano, um, early to middle Miocene the um, shallow subduction underneath the northern Puna, uh, middle to late Miocene against the southern Puna, so it's like it's decreasing this way, and we're going to suggest that that can be correlated with the southward migration of the Juan Fernandez Ridge. OK, so shallow subduction has occurred repeatedly and is a characteristic feature of the Andean margin. OK, what's the evidence? Magmatic signals for Andean flat slab uh, subduction, flat slabs. And this is very relevant, I think, to the Laramide, uh, the western US. 
Um, the evidence comes from the timing, chemical, isotopic characteristics of the structural settings of the magmatic rocks. Okay, first we've got to look at what the magmatic arc is doing. And some people think when you have a flat slab, what happens is the arc, the arc front migrates to the east. But that's not what happens. What happens is the magmatic front broadens. So we want to look for broadening of the magmatic, magmatic arc and the deformational front away from the trench. The, as the slab shallows, we see a decrease in the erupted magma, magma volume. And if we go to, into a true flat slab, slab stage, the volcanism uh, ceases. OK, so what do these magmatic centers look like? And this is where we get into the geochemistry. Because if you have a shallow subduction zone, you have a slab under there. And it'd be nice if you see some evidence of that slab component. And so the magmatic centers that are far in the back arc and up to 700 kilometers of the trench are going to have some subduction-like chemical features. And the most important of this, I'll get to this in a minute, is the depletion of the high field strength elements, uh, the tantalum and niobium and titanium particularly. There's arguments about what this is, uh, but this is what everybody accepts as the slab signature. Uh, you can argue that it can be inherited from the continental crust because a lot of continental crust shows a slab signature, so you have to demonstrate that that slab signature is related to the shallow subduction zone. Okay, and then when the slab steepens up, and this seems to be, uh, you get vo voluminous widespread bar back arc magmatism and a progressive trenchward narrowing of the magnetic front at, at the end. So you see a broadening of the arc, a narrowing of the arc, and if the magmatism shuts off, of course it shuts off. But, uh, so we will see examples of various cases where the slab actually goes flat, other cases where it doesn't totally go flat and just shallows. Okay, we need to uh, look a little bit at our magmatic rock geochemical toolbox. And uh, I decided that I would try and keep this very simple. Everybody has seen these awful spider diagrams, and most geophysicists go out and out the door, or other people go out the door. So I, I'll try and just give you the sense of what you what you need. And uh, so we're going to um, have a little primer primer here, and uh, some simple. And these are simple compared to a lot of the modern stuff that's being done, but still useful geochemical indicators. OK, the first one, the measure of the subduction zone component, is indicated by the depletion of the high field strength elements, tantalum and niobium. And usually this is, when we talk about depletion, you've got to talk about depletion relative to something. So we usually talk about depletion. OK, here's tantalum and niobium down here in this little spider gram. This is for an arc basalt. You see they're really depleted. And this is relative, usually relative to the light rare earths. Um, so we're gonna, that, that's going to be important because we're looking for a slab signature. So, what? Oh, it's, this is, I'm sorry, it's this is a nor, uh, log normalized and it's normalized to bulk earth. I cut off the graph, I forgot to fix that. Okay. Yeah, one, one would be bulk earth. One is bulk earth. So morb is depleted relative to bulk earth. And if you just grind up the whole earth and took what the chemistry of the whole earth would be, that's the whole earth. But we get it from meteorites. Yeah, we get it from meteorites. But not bulk earth. No. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, then we can get uh, increase in the light, what's called the light element lithophiles, like barium. Barium can be transported in water. Uh, thorium can come in in sediments. So this is something else that is the uh, measure of a subduction zone component. But it's a little trickier when we work in the Andes because we've got continental crust involved. OK, we're going to look at rare earths. We're going to do a lot with rare earth patterns. And uh, so I just go on to, here's a, just a rare earth pattern. OK. So this is normalized, log normalized to chondrites. And uh, so 
the rare earths are nice because they're mainly plus three cations and they grade regularly in size. So, so they, they, it takes some sort of anomaly or some sort of mineral or something to hold back part of them to get the signature. So you can use the rare earths to essentially decipher mineralogy that you don't see in the rock. And this is really important when we talk about garnet and amphibole because they're cryptic. And so you look at the rock, it doesn't have garnet in it, but you can tell that it had garnet in it because the um, heavy rare earths are sequestered in garnet. And so if you have garnet, you have low heavy rare earths. So let's just go through this. Okay, so rare earth patterns. Um, if we look at the samarium euterbium ratio, um, indicate retention of a high pressure residual phase, and particularly garnet. And uh, there's now been a lot of discussion recently, and this has been around for a long time, but if you take out the low mi middle rarers, um, this is amphibole. So amphibole and garnet uh, take out both heavy, but the uh, amphibole takes out preferentially the middle rarers. So if we um, now, if you're looking at a lot of data, you can't plot all the patterns, so you plot ratios. And if you're particularly interested in garnet, you usually plot the samarium uh, euterbium ratio. This is euterbium here. And uh, the garnet takes out the heavy rare earths relative to the light rare earths. Uh, if you want to test whether amphibole is involved, then people, some people use uh, terbium, some people use dysprosium, some people use gadolinium. Actually, the ICPMS, I think, has done a disservice because now we have all of these and everybody plots every different ratio, and I can't even keep track which ratio, the, what the ratios, the numbers mean. Okay, so um, you can figure out whether you've got amphibole, you can figure out garnet, and uh, the other important rare earth here is europium. Now, europium's plus three, but in a reducing conditions, it goes to plus two, and so people equate the europium anomaly with removing plagioclase, and plagioclase uh, is a relatively um, low pressure phase. It's uh, around 30, 35, maybe 40 kilometers, you lose plagioclase. So if you, you have to, uh, so this, this is a sort of, you can think of the index of plagioclase, the, the uh, samarium euterbium is an index of garnet. These ratios is an uh, index of amphibole. The one tricky thing about the europium anomaly is that because it's, it has to be a reducing condition. So if you have very oxidizing conditions, you're, there's no europium anomaly, even though you've removed a lot of plagioclase. So the way you resolve that is you know strontium goes into plagioclase, whether it uh, has uh, oxidizing or reducing conditions. So you have to play with europium versus strontium. That's, that's very important. And then the lanthanum samarium, the, the light rarers, uh, they don't particularly like most of the common mineral phases. And so they are an index of uh, light element uh, enrichment. And so uh, we usually talk about lanthanum samarium uh, as enrichment. So that's sort of a geochemical primer, and we're going to be showing plots. I'll be showing plots of samarium euterbium versus lanthanum samarium, and uh, we'll be looking at europium anomalies. And so just remember, europium anomalies tells us about plagioclase. The samarium euterbium ratios tell us about garnet. Garnet is important because garnet signals high pressure, and uh, the lanthanum samarium tells us something about how enriched the source is. Okay, and then I think people are more comfortable with isotopes, at least geophysicists. I was told by one geophysicist that isotopes are geophysics anyway. They're in geophysics textbooks <laughs> because they have equations. <laughs> I thought that was really kind of weird. It was like a you chemist doesn't use an equation. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we can think of strontium and neodymium. We'll talk mainly about strontium and neodymium today. 
Okay, and uh, then we have to think about, we're talking about subduction geometry, so what are the components we're trying to sort out? This is a Schmidt and Pauli diagram, but, but we have hydrous components. This is fluids coming off the slab. Um, melting in the mantle wedge. We can have melting in the asthenosphere, melting of the lithosphere. We could have melting of the slab, but uh, in the Andes, despite many of the things that's said, it's not important. Um, we have subducted sediment. We can have uh, sub sediment. We can get a signal from the sediment. I mentioned the slab melding. We're going to talk about four arc subduction erosion. This is a important theme at the moment. How much material are we seeing from four arc subduction erosion? It's, although the Andes is a great place for four arc subduction erosion, it's also a hard place to detect it because the geochemical signatures are not so different than subducted sediment and uh, crustal contamination. So we have to be clever and figure out ways that we can separate what we're seeing from four arc subduction erosion from subducted sediments and contaminated lithosphere. Okay. So now you're all expert geochemists, right? Is everybody with me? You got it all? That's all you need to know, at least for this talk. OK, so we're going to look now at uh, five transects. We're going to start um, looking at the Chilean flat slab, uh, which comes across here. These are the Sierras Pompeianas, uh, these gray things out here, which are equivalent to the Laramide ranges. The green on this map here is uh, foreland fold and thrust belts, and generally thin skin fold and fold and thrust belts, and Ono has just given us a whole lot of discussion of the one up here. Uh, the Precordillera is here, and the area in red is the area be above 3,700 meters. So the Altiplano in the north, as he said, the Big Basin, and the Puna to the south. And the Puna, um, you notice this black here, these are called the Santa Barbara Ranges, and uh, they're sort of uh, inverted Cretaceous normal faults. So the beautiful fold and thrust belt ends here and picks up again here. So I think that's a uh, uh, primer on, on the Andes. OK, so we're going to now look, and uh, this is stuff that, I, that we did a long time ago, but uh, it was the Chilean flat slab, so we're going to look at a profile across it. And this is a cartoon that we published in 2002, and I think George will tell us a little bit more, more modern uh, slab geometry, but I don't think it's changed all that much. I mean, it's, it's really flat. And uh, we have then the foreland fold and thrust belt here, the thick crust here, and uh, the argument is that uh, the crustal thickening is uh, we have thin skin thrusting here, but the main thickening is due to lower crustal flow, if I can use that word. Essentially, the, the ductal lower crust um, is what's causing the thickening here. And then we have the uh, high angle faults in the um, Sierras Pompeianas. Okay, and then we have the magmatism. Okay, so. I put these little red things here. These are the volcanoes. But you can see that the magmatism in the Cordillera, I just put uh, greater than 6 million years. We, um, it starts in the early Miocene. I don't want to go back and talk about all of it, but say greater than 6 million years. Uh, and back, um, well, early Miocene. Then the magmatism spreads out, so we have this is the broadening, the beginning of the broadening of the arc. It starts at 16 million years, and magmatism in the precordillera shuts off at 7 million years. And then we have the magmatism in the Sierras Pompeianas, which is between 8 and 5 million years. And what, what I want you to notice is that the magmatism shuts off between 5 and 7 million years across the whole region. It's not like the arc is just migrating across. It broadens, and then it shuts off. OK, so these are some cartoons um, trying to track uh, what's going on. And uh, so we see the first evidence of uh, shallowing or something happening um, after about 18 million years. In the early Miocene, we have uh, back arc 
um, alkali basalts, there's no evidence in any shortening, there's no evidence from the magnetism that there's a thick crust. So this is normal. Starting about 18 million years, and this is before the Juan Fernandez Ridge arrives, it arrives around 11 million years, uh, we start to see the magnetism broadening out and deformation going into the back arc. So there's something happening before the, the um, Juan Fernandez Ridge arrives on the scene. But things really pick up after about 11 to 10 million years, and this is when the, the uh, Juan Fernandez Ridge arrives and we go into the uh, flat slab. So magnetism front broadens to the east, volume decreases, the deformation front moves into the as far east as the Sierras Pompeianas, and the deformation front, the, mag, the, the easternmost magnetism is essentially in the easternmost range. So there seems to be some control about where the magnetism is and where the deformation is. And the other important thing is uh, that we start out with a uh, there's no magnetism, nothing going on in the back arc, so I think we start out with some sort of a normal thickness lithosphere, but that lithosphere now is very thin, so, so that continental lithosphere has to be thinned. So we're not only squeezing out the asthenosphere, we have to be removing lithosphere. And uh, I don't have time to talk about it, but some of these volcanic rocks, this Pocho Magmatic Center, which is in the Sierra de Cordoba and the easternmost, I think it has a geochemical signature that is some of, some of that lithosphere. And during this time, the crust thickens for 40 to 65 kilometers beneath the arc as the back arc crust shortens and the crustal s signature grows in those rocks. And okay, so um, here's some rare earth patterns. Uh, this is uh, for the early stage. Um, here's the high field strength element depletion in the arc rocks, the lack of high field arc element distinction in the back arc alkali basalts when the crust was thin. And then we see uh, the magmatism. This is in the main arc through time. And you see the rare earth patterns here. And you see the bottom dropping out of the heavy rare earths. So the samarium euterbium ratios are um, increasing with time. And uh, we think that this is first garnet and ampable. Uh, and this is accompanying and this is recording uh, the evolution, the, the thickness of the crust. So we're reading the thickness of the crust partly out of uh, looking at the rare earth patterns. And then how do we do that? Well, then we go to the southern volcanic zone uh, where the crustal thickness is 70 kilometers in the north and 30 kilometers in the south. And we look at the rare earth patterns, or we look at the geochemistry of those uh, rocks erupting out of the modern day volcanoes. We look at the crustal thickness there, and we try to um, match it up. So, so that's how we're reading out the crustal thickness. That's why I say the crustal thickness, and it's with some caveats, increased to 40 to 60 kilometers. And this is, this is the signal from the uh, so 8 to 5 million year old rocks in the way in the back arc. And you see that they do have uh, an anomaly in tantalum. So there is the evidence that the uh, um, slab signature. So this this is uh, so this is just a recording of the samarium euterbium ratio. And I just put pyroxene, hornblende, and garnet just roughly, so that as the ratio comes across, you you need these minerals. These, this is your guide for what the residual mineralogy is. And so you see the lanthanum samarium ratio, which is a measure of the, ple the enrichment isn't changing very much. The dramatic signal is in the samarium euterbium. And uh, we also, this is a neodymium versus strontium plot. And this is the early Miocene. This is the middle Miocene and the late Miocene. So you see that in the main arc, uh, we are increasing the continental uh, signature. And as, so as the crust thickens, we're seeing more crustal contamination. And we'll come back to this because when we originally did this work, we thought all of this crustal signature was coming out of the crust. Now um, I'm not sure that some of this isn't coming from forex subduction erosion as well. And then I guess I have to mention this awful word here, the adakite. How many people have heard of an adakite? Everybody's heard of an adakite. It's a word that should have been thrown out. Drummond and Defont should have been strung up, and they put the world into a huge mess. But anyway, I will make one point. If you read the slab melt model of Goucher, 
the shallow subduction zones are associated with slab melting. This is a this proves you don't read every you don't believe everything that you read in geology, because he used my chemistry to prove this and he messed it all up and I should have written a reply, but. Uh, there's a lot of problems with this thermal model. The paper reads beautifully. But he has a thin lithosphere extending to Buenos Aires at 20 million years. There's no evidence for that. Uh, the slab melts. There's no Aedekite, Aedekite signatures in the rocks that he said were the slab melts, where those out Pocho, they don't have the Aedekite signature. What is an Aedekite signature? Aedekite signature is a steep rare earth pattern and a high strontium-yttrium ratio. And, the, and these rocks don't have that signature. Those ro the rocks that have those signatures are over here in the main Cordillera. So he, he confused that. And also, the other problem with his thermal model is he's able to get uh, essentially silicic melts. Well, the big problem is that the volcanic rocks over here in Pocho include basalts and basaltic andesites. And they're associated with this. And so there's no way that those are slab melts. So forget slab melting associated with shallow subduction zone. And basically, in most of the central Andes, the slab is too old and cold to melt. And so at least in this part of the central Andes, there is not a big slab melt component. So we can. Suggesting that we not read this paper. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> You were in Colombia and Penrose, and you know Goucher stayed away from this. At one point, we were at a meeting, and Goucher said, he says, I'm not going to talk about this, because I'm just going to get in trouble with this audience. <laughs> so anyway, there is, uh, the, the, there is one possible candidate for slab melting in the Andes, but it's associated with the Chile Triple Junction, where you have the, the, the active ridge subduction. And if, it, if you don't find it there, you're not going to find it anywhere. OK, so we have talked to then about uh, the shallow subduction zone. Now, um, we talked about the Sierras Pompeianas. These are the Sierras Pompeianas out here. Uh, the volcanic rocks out here in Pocho. I didn't mention San Luis, but they're out here as well. And uh, so if we look to the south, where the slab is now steep, um, in the, through the middle part of the southern volcanic zone down here, we also see some back arc magmatic rocks. And uh, particularly the center at Chachuen and Cerro Nevado. And uh, these are similar age. They're, they're sitting in uplifted um, high angle fault blocks. Now, this looks kind of similar to what we're seeing here. What's different down here is that we have um, a whole lot. So these are eight to four million years. So they're actually even the same age. And then uh, once we get down here, um, after less than three million years, we have massive amounts of uh, back arc basalts. And that most of this stuff in here is back arc basalts and back arc alkaline rocks. So what happened? And so uh, I actually got paid by an oil company to do a project down there. And uh, we started looking at uh, particularly this Chachawen Center. And uh, if you compare, this is just to look at the potassium silica diagram. You can see uh, they're all high potassium um, andesites and dacites down into mafic, an and they all contain hornblende. So what are those rocks doing out there? The other thing is that I said that the San Luis and the Pocho rocks had this, some of this high field strength element depletion, and uh, so does the Sierra de Chachuen. And so, but the Sierra de Chachuen is really nice because it has older basalts of 20 to 22 million years um, in the same range, and younger basalts of less than 3 million years in the same range. And so this is the uh, slab signature here. They show no slab signature at all. They're perfectly interplate basalts. So in that region, where the Chachuen volcanic field is, uh, so Chachuen is here. And the basalts are in this exactly the same place. So we see um, basalts that have no slab signature. They have not got anything coming out of the crust or out of an enriched upper mantle. We see that slab signature go in, and we see it disappear again. 
So the simplest way to interpret this, and this is not just based on that alone, um, I don't have time to talk about all of the other things, but that's the most, uh, um, the strongest geochemical signature. So, so we're suggesting that even in, the, in that region where the slab is steep today, so, so this would be the modern slab geometry today, this is the modern slab geometry in the flat slab, that, uh, that, that there's a parallel history here. It starts out 25 to 20 million years with a steep slab back arc basalts. Um, starting at 19 to 16 million years, we see uh, that slab signature starting to creep into the back arc. And uh, by eight to five million years, we have uh, this Sierra de Chachuen that looks a lot like Pocho. And we don't know what the depth of the slab here, but Pocho is currently 180 to 200 kilometers above the slab. So we assume that this um, was under similar conditions. And so the slab is parallel up to this point, but then this one really goes really flat and this one is not as flat. And this is only 500 kilometers, and this is 700 kilometers from the trench. And then what happens? Now we've got to explain all of those uh, basalts, that uh, interplate type basalts. So one way to explain those is to steepen the slab and have uh, essentially decompression mantle melding producing the uh, back arc plateau basalts. So we go from a uh, small slab-related signature into, and so this is this, is this magmatic flare-up. So, so there you see the whole history of the shallow subduction zone. And uh, you can read the history out of the deformation and the magmatism. And this is a place uh, where the shortening is less, but there's still some shortening. This is about the end of the shortening. When we get to the south of this, we lose the signature. And as Ono said, the shortening goes away. But there, there, were, there is some shortening here. And so this is not a dramatic a shallow subduction zone. The crust never gets as thick. But here is a cryptic shallowing of the subduction zone. OK, let's now move back up into the uh, um, the main part of the Andes go up to the Puna Altiplano. And uh, we're going to then look at, we said that uh, we thought we saw shallowing, evidence for shallowing of subduction zones here. So um, this is a SRA satellite radar um, image, the topographic image. And uh, this is the Altiplano up here. But all these red things on here, the red and the blue, are the very high elevations. And those are the volcanic centers. And so we're going to look at the volcanic centers, and we're going to look at the try to read the slab history from the um, volcanism, and we also use the deformation. So we're, we'll start. Let's see. And so this is in a paper that we published in a GSA memoir from the Backbone meeting. For those of you who know who the Backbone meeting was, um, trying to make lithospheric lithospheric scale cartoons um, of these three shallowing subduction zones. So one is it near 20 degrees. This is the southern Altiplano. This is the Puna, the northern Puna, and this is the southern Puna. And uh, the arrows indicate the shallowing and the, I'm sorry, the arrows indicate the steepening and the downward pointing arrows indicate the shallowing. So um, we'll talk about each one of these. But these, these are cartoons. But actually, we put a lot of work in trying to do it as realistically as we could. The slab dips are actually based on the Cahill and Isaacs modern slab uh, dips. And we tried to match up similar uh, magmatic features uh, through time. And so, so the shapes of the slab here are actually from the uh, modern, we tried to find a modern transect that we thought corresponded to what would be happening. So these are, these are as realistic as we could. And uh, we tried to make sense out of the lithospheric thicknesses, uh, the crustal thicknesses, the fold and thrust belts are here, and the magmatism is here. So, so we'll talk about these. And these little blobs here, as you see there's blobs here, well, that's the delaminated crust. So the crust gets thick, it goes to eclogite, and it drops off. So, so these are the delamination. How does it connect to the, the slab falling away? 
already, um, creating suction to the real part of the overlying lithosphere down? Or I think. Is it just converting it, creating temperature? I think, uh, well, it depends on what you think shallows a slab, but what seems to shallow the slab is some feature moving through, and so when that feature has already passed through the system, then the slab steepens up again. And so the, uh, you, you get the shortening, you get the crustal thickening. Um, like in urals, the crust is thick, you've got eclogite, but it's not dropping off. because there's, So there's two conditions to get delamination. One is the density contrast, and one is happening a, a, a properly um, fluid environment that it can actually drop off. So, so, so I think that the, the story is that it, it thickens, it gets dense, and then when the slab steepens, the, it becomes gravitationally unstable and, and falls off. So, th so that's the cycle. And, and I'm going to make a lot out of this cycle. So, so we have uh, shortening, uh, thickening of the crust uh, during the shallow part, and then when it steepens up, it falls off. Okay, so this is the Puna Plateau. Um, we're going to look at two transects. Okay, this is the northern Puna. This is the transect that Ono was looking at was uh, up here about 20, 21 degrees, so we're just to the south. And, and we'll look at one in the southern Puna. And these are the big ignimbrite complexes. So um, we're going to associate the ignimbrites with the delamination and the, and the slab change. So the timing of the ignimbrites uh, to me is important in terms of uh, determining the uh, timing of the shallow subduction. Okay, so th the other thing is what we'll, um, we're going to talk about what these ignimbrites are made of, and uh, it's important when we start trying to determine how much of the material in the ignimbrites, uh, the estimates go from their 100% crustal melting to their 0% crustal melting. So how much crustal melt, how much new material is being added and how much is actually being uh, recycled. And so um, we have to look for the signatures of the crust. And so it's, it's going to be important that there's a sedimentary basin in the Altiplano, that there's more of an igneous basement in the Puna, and uh, then we have this strong arc basement. So this is more an igneous basement, this is more a sedimentary basement, and this is more, uh, has a very much stronger arc signature. And we're going to look for those, those signatures. Okay, so for those of you who've never seen an ignimbrite, this is what they look like. They're, they're, uh, we'll talk about the volumes, but this is a typical Puna ignimbrite. There's Onok's probably seen millions of them. Very impressive. <laughs> All right. How big is that? What's the scale? What's the scale? Uh, well, I don't know. A person would come up to about here. Person, a person would be about like that, a six-footer. <laughs> this is the shrubbery in the front. You can see it here. I don't, I don't know exactly how high, 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 how high that wall is, but it's impressive. Okay, so um, let's talk then about the northern Punas, and this is the steepening of an amagmatic flat slab. So we think the most dramatic shallowing of the subduction zone in the uh, Puna Altiplano, the old one, was actually right here, which is where the biggest field of ignimbrites are. And if we look at the history, uh, so the, the geometry at 26 to 17 million years, there's no magmatism going on. There's deformation spread across the region. And so I've just used the geometry of the Chilean flat slab. Then um, about 16, well, we, there's a little bit, but the real magmatism starts about 14, 12 million years. We start to see little bits of magmatism. And uh, that starts over in the west, or in the east, so there's little uh, essentially small domes and stocks. And importantly, if you like minerals, if you like silver, this is the, the Potosi, the richest silver deposit. The, this is the main mineralization stage in this part of the Andes is at, at this time, just as the slab steepens. And uh, okay, then the real 
ignimbrites start at about 10 million years with the main uh, back arc flux of ignimbrites between 10 and 6 million years. And so this, this is when uh, the, the, really all of the action is going on. Um, we think there's time, this is a time of delamination. So, so we have decompression, melting, delamination, and this is all uh, contributing to melting. Uh, the mafic magma is entering and melting the crust and producing these huge ignimbrites. And we'll talk about the volumes in a minute. And uh, this is also, we have in sequence thrusting in the sub Andean belt. And then uh, the ignimbrites move, the, the volcanic zone narrows. So now we're into the narrowing stage. The big ignimbrites are now more towards the uh, main arc. And I don't know if this is significant, but it's also the same time the out-of-sequence thrusting starts in the sub-Andean belt, and I have to think that there's a relationship. And then we come less than three million years, we have the central volcanic zone, and the ignimbrites are dead. So, so that's uh, the, our history, and so we, we see shallowing, uh, a steepening of the subduction zone, and it's during the steepening of that subduction zone that we think we see the, the evidence for delamination and the big buildup of the ignimbrites. So in your estimating the scale of the delamination from the size of the volcano? Yeah, um, there's actually some seismic information now, but yeah, the, originally when... Review what you separate as evidence from mantle melting associated with just return flow and the slab steepens relative to mass melting due to delamination? Uh, uh, we're working on that, but I can't really tell you the portions. So where is the, what is the e evidence of the delamination? The evidence of the delamination is the uh, crustal thickness, the, the more or less silicic crust to the base. But, but you're seeing this in the, in the record on the surface today, so what how do you know I'm seeing it in the, in the in the chemistry. I mean, I, I that, well, and also there's seismic evidence. Just a minute. Here it is. This is I didn't do this, but this is uh, actually mainly Ono's group. Uh, these are some cartoons. They've of tomographic. These are P wave tomographic images, and they think these are the delaminated blocks, and this is the melting. And this is another image uh, a little further south, and these are the delaminated blocks, and this is the melting. And actually, uh, this is our original cartoon in 1994, which we drew for the southern Puna. And actually, the size of our block is about the same as the uh, blocks that, they, that, they, that they're showing. And the thickness, we, and, and that was just based on um, where the, the magmatism it was based on the magnitude. But it's fair to say that this is an inference rather than a, a direct observation. Yeah, right. I mean, unless you believe that tomography, tomography is a direct observation. I have, otherwise it's just inferred, yes. Okay, so I said I'd talk about volumes. Um, this is, these are the ignimbrites. I'll just put them up here. Okay, so 10 million years, 120. Okay, it's 8.5 when things really get started, 1,400, 1,000, so 2,400 cubic kilometers at, at around 8 million years. Then we have 600, another uh, 1,300, 3,400, 1,500, 1,600, 100. So if we sum all that up, it's over 9,000 uh, cubic kilometers. Uh, of ignimbrite erupted just in the central Puna from 10 to 4 million years. So the question is, uh, how much of that is original? How much of it is, uh, um, how much is remelting crust? Because you come up with a very different model if you just remelt the crust than as if you're actually adding uh, new crust. So we're going to go back to the geochemistry a little bit, and uh, we're going to look at what's called metaluminosity. So we look at <laughs> aluminum over potassium, sodium, and calcium. Paraluminous rocks have more alkalis, so, uh, and uh, metaluminous rocks. So this is more like an igneous base, and this is more like a uh, shale base. And we actually, we start to see that there are, all of these are dacites. They all have about the same silica content, uh, but they have very different chemical signatures. And we think that we can correlate these chemical signatures with the basement. So this says there's something from the basement coming in. 
and this is just another diagram, sodium, potassium, and uh, the potassium contents in Penisos, particularly which are in the sedimentary rocks, uh, are very, very low. Normally, uh, igneous rocks have about 3% sodium. These are about 2%. So we're seeing um, some crustal signature in there. We've got to have some crustal signature. Okay, the other question is what level are these things developing? I talked about europium anomalies. All the ignimbrites, regardless of where they're from, have significant europium anomalies. So these are some rare earth patterns. You can see the europium anomalies. And uh, the, you see they all have the same silica content, but we have a big range in europium anomalies. But they also have high strontium contents. So, and we're going to see that they have steep, heavy rare earth patterns. So th what this is saying is that this is not a process that occurs at one level. Okay, so here's the um, europium anomaly versus the samarium euterbium. Samarium euterbium over about four requires garnet. Uh, that's usually um, interpreted as being a very deep crust, yet we have significant europium anomalies. So uh, we can talk about a two-stage process where the samarium euterbium, the garnet retention is in the lower crust, melting in the lower crust. The melts then pool in the mid-crust in these uh, low velocity, low um, velocity anomalies uh, that are being interpreted as partial melt zones or magma chambers. That's where the European anomalies are developing and then uh, we have the eruption. So, so we have both, uh, there's no clear correlation of silica, sumerium euterbium with negative and high uh, European anomalies. High strontium requires a two-level process. High samarium euterbium indicate a role for garnet as a residual phase. A trend to lower ratios in the same area could indicate a changing role as melt progresses. And uh, we've just published a paper on this if you're interested in all the details. The other, the other thing is that uh, there's uh, the, all the ignimbrites, there's a huge variation in the isotopic compositions. So this goes along with what I was saying about the sodium potassium. This, this is the crustal component. So spatial variability reflects differences in crustal components. Temporal trends also indicate that, the, and this has to do with crustal flow, uh, that things are changing in the same place through time. So we can have crustal flow, which is changing what's coming up. And we can also be, as, as we're adding mantle material, uh, we also, the crust becomes more mantle-like as you am add material from the mantle. Okay, um, oops, got to go the wrong way. Okay, so this leads us to a model for the ignimbrites um, where this is, uh, okay, this is as the slab is steepening, we get decompression melding. This is the mantle melt zone. The, the, the melts come up to the base of the crust. Uh, they have uh, they, they cause partial melting. This is this, okay, this would be at a 50 or 60 kilometer thick crust. This is the garnet, the melts percolate up. We have a zone of melt accumulation. Uh, this is the second stage. And uh, the, um, this is where the plagioclase fractionation is occurring. So this is why we can get steep rare earth patterns with big europium anomalies because it's, it's not occurring at the, most of the melting is occurring here and most of the, uh, uh, the shallow level fractionation is occurring here. And then the question is what happens because uh, when they erupt, uh, people talk about ignimbrites coming from shallow levels, four to eight kilometers. And so we have these partial melt zones and uh, somehow these magmas get squeezed up. They have a low resonance time, short-lived resonance time in the upper crust and where they vesiculate and essentially uh, blow up. And uh, we tried to look at the timing of the ignimbrites, and there seems to be some correlation with the times of pulses of compressional deformation. So one idea is that the crust uh, gets very melt-charged. It's under compression. Essentially, the, the crust becomes to the point that it can no longer uh, sustain that uh, compression and essentially collapses. Uh, it thickens. And uh, at the same time, we get deformation out here. So the whole, the whole cycle is, um, and this is obviously a working model, but the whole cycle is related. So the timing of the big ignimbrites actually may have to do with the timing of the big thrust. 
Okay, so then we get down to how much magma and how much, how much is coming from the mantle and how much from the crust. And one of the most important pieces of information from this comes from the oxygen isotopes. And these were done by Gerhard Werner. We did them on quartz. We did them on mineral separates. And uh, then we did uh, simulation fractionalization crystallization modeling uh, using strontium isotopes and strontium and some other trace elements across the whole plateau. And believe it or not, there's not a huge database for neodymium and, and uh, lead. So we had to work, mainly work on strontium. And we found that if we varied the crustal component uh, with being um, with igneous in some places, more paraluminous or more sedimentary in other places, and more arc-like in other components, that in all of the systems, regardless of the broad range we see, we could do it with about a 50-50 match of new magma coming in from the crust, uh, from the mantle, and uh, 50 melting uh, from the crust. So about half and half. And actually, if you think of thermal balances, this makes sense too. You gotta, what, you gotta melt the crust. How are you gonna melt it? Well, you can melt it by bringing in hot magma from below. And so a one-to-one -one volume sort of makes sense. So the geochemistry sort of works on that extent. Okay, then we said, okay, this is getting around to Ono's question, how, how much new uh, crust are we making out of the magmas? I mean, because when people say, well, there's a lot of magmatism, a lot of crust, they look at these big ignimbrites and say, okay, this is where it's coming from. You got these huge ignimbrites. Okay, so um, we now are going to assume we have half coming from the mantle, half coming from the crust. Uh, we uh, calculated the volume for all the ignimbrites from the southern Puna, from, on the Puna, then the southern Altiplano. We got an erupted volume of 11,000 cubic kilometers. And uh, then we have to come up with a pluton to ignimbrite, extrusive to intrusive ratio, and that's very important. So a lot of people have worked on this problem, and most people would put it around between 3 and 5 to 1, or 4 and 5 to 1. And actually, we played with it at 10 to 1, and at 10 to 1, it doesn't make any sense at all. But uh, so um, if you then, uh, do that, you can come up with an arc magma production rate in cubic kilometers per kilometer per million years. And uh, so this would be for the uh, Puna between seven and four million years. And so we get an arc magmatic production rate at a rate of five to one of 19 uh, cubic kilometers per kilometer per million years. And this is not taking into account the arc volcanism that's going on, but, but this, is, this is where the important volume is at this time. And just, just for uh, uh, comparison, uh, here are some proposed global rates. Uh, this is one that's been around for a long time, 30 cubic kilometers per kilometer per million years. You see this all the time, Van Huni and Shaw. This, this is 1999. They also used it in 2009. Um, so that's one rate that's been around for a long time. You can see this is below that rate. Some people more recently have proposed much higher rates. Uh, there's a paper on the Aleutians that takes into account subduction erosion, where at least to make the, make the Aleutians, Aleutians is nice because you don't have pre-existing continental crust. You have to take out the oceanic crust, but they still get 72 cubic kilometers per kilometer a million years to build up the Aleutians. And then Ducia and the Sierras and for the Mesozoic was talking about flare-up rates of 90 cubic kilometers. So, so we're down here in the noise, really. And you can also then use this, if you spread it out across the whole plateau, how much crust can you make? Well, if you, cr if you spread it across the plateau where the ignimbrites are, if the, the ignimbrite to um, extrusive intrusive ratio is 3 to 1, you can make less than a kilometer of crust. If you can make it five to one, you can make 1.3 kilometers, and we've got to make it, we've got to increase 20, 25. There's no way this is doing nothing. And even at 10 to one, it's two kilometers. So this shows you that magmatism has an important role of providing the heat and the, and the ductility, but it's not adding to the volume. Okay, we can uh, make a similar story in the southern Puna. Uh, different set of cartoons, but, uh, and the story is a little different because the magmatism, the ignimbrites are younger. The, and uh, the argument down here is that we started out with a uh, normally dipping slab. So we didn't start with a shallow slab because the magmatism 
in the early Miocene is concentrated in the West, and uh, that, that then the magmatism spreads across. And so that, uh, so this is the broadening of the arc. So for us, this is the shallowing of the subduction zone, and we can track that in the uh, volcanism. And yes, this volcanism all shows an arc signature. So uh, we suggest that it started steeper and then actually shallowed, and then uh, it then re-steepened. And when it steepened up, this was our initial proposal for delamination underneath Cerro de Juan in the southern Puna. And we have a seismic experiment that I was my uh, dual career as a geophysicist, sort of. Uh, and anyway, we ran a seismic experiment, and, they, and the argument was that uh, we would be able to see the evidence for delamination. And so far, we're still working on the tomography, but there is a thin crust, a hot lithosphere, and, and a thin lithosphere. So. Uh, at least it's reasonable. And uh, so delamination and uh, the Cerro Golan ignorbrite, and we argued that the Cerro Golan ignorbrite. And uh, okay, evidence for at least the crustal thickening and possibly melts of this coming up. I didn't put it in, but we have some day sites with some of the steepest rare patterns on Earth that have got to come from somewhere. Okay, so again, then steepening of the subduction zone, delamination. Uh, ignimbrite flare-up, and uh, here the last ignimbrite in the back arc, uh, the youngest age of Golan is 2.06 million years. To the north, the back arc ignimbrites were over by 7 million years. Okay, so I just had to put this in here. I just put it in this morning, but this, this was our seismic network. Uh, we had a 75 station array, and uh, you're going to start seeing a lot of results from this very soon. <clears throat> okay, so evidence supporting delamination under the southern Puna. This was what we used as our initial argument back in 1994. One is the uh, high topography. Uh, and it's hard to explain the high topography by crustal shortening. There's not a lot of crustal shortening off to the east, so thermal is one way, and it is hot. I think uh, seismolo the seismology is showing that. Um, geophysical data suggesting a thinner lithosphere and crust than to the north, and this is holding up. Um, importantly, there was a regional change in stress system. Um, we think the delamination started about six million years ago. At that time, we went from a and this is the work of Rick Almendinger and his students that uh, largely the kinematic studies show that it was under compression about six million years ago. You start to get uh, some normal faulting, some strike slip faulting, a very uh, messy stress regime. And that, and that happens just as the magmatism is, uh, is starting, just as the ignimbrites are, are starting. So magmatic, magmatic distribution pattern and a distinctive chemistry, steep rare earth patterns in intermediate to silicic rocks. Uh, these very glassy, there's, there are rocks in the Puna that are essentially, well, I cut my tendon if you want <laughs> evidence, but you hit them, it's like hitting a Coke bottle. It's a, just incredibly glassy lavas, and you don't see those to the north. And uh, we also have um, mafic volcanism. And uh, so there, there is a fair amount of mafic volcanism. And some of these rocks, some of these mafic rocks, uh, have interplate-like uh, signatures, so they've lost the slab signature. And this suggests that it's very hot. So that's uh, the story. And this is then the trace elements. This be, uh, you can think of this as uh, lanthanum euterbium, the garnet coming in, or samarium euterbium. OK, so this is, has to do with the crustal thickening and the delamination. OK, thin crust, it's thickening. Here's the time of the delamination at the thickest crust, and now we don't have evidence of that. And uh, this is the lanthanum tantalum, and I won't go into that. OK, so we got one more transect to go. And this is an area where there's been much less work done on the volcanism. Uh, this is up in the Altiplano. This is essentially the transect that Ono just talked about. Uh, it goes through the Las Frailes ignimbrite. These black things here are uh, mafic lavas, and I, di I couldn't resist putting in a, a map, of the, a picture of the Frileys. This, these are incredible. These, these are 100, 100 meters thick, just incredible thicknesses of ignimbrites. 
Okay, so Les Frileys is interesting because uh, we've had magmatism going on for almost 25 million years in essentially the same place. And for all the discussion of uplift and deformation and delamination and everything that's gone on in the Alta Plano, nobody has really looked at it relative to the magma, so we decided uh, this is a, a, a pro our project and it's still preliminary. But okay, so these are just uh, the ages of the magmatism. The other thing I'd like to say is that this orange thing is essentially the Les Frileys. And if you read the literature, it'll say that it's six to nine million years old, that it's all six to nine, and I used to like that a lot. But uh, now the, uh, there are very few ages. That was based on two ages up here and uh, one age to the south down here that I don't have, and the Maricacola ignimbrite up here, which is well dated with 6.4 to 8.5 8 .5 million years. So the supposition was that was the age. But now um, Simon Lamb and his group have been in there and they've done some argon, one argon, argon age, and they got 2.24 on one of those big ignimbrites. So I think that uh, we may have to reevaluate this. Okay, but this is interesting because I'm sure that most, many of you followed the Molnar and Gar Garzioni story in the central Andes where they want to delaminate the whole Puna uh, to cause the uplift between seven and nine million years. So this is your, their uplift data. I actually think you can explain a lot of this by previous deformation, by crustal flow, but I actually think they may have a point that there was some delamination at this time, not just not on the scales. So medium large ignimbrites at 10 to 6 coincide with their window of uplift. And uh, the other thing that's interesting about the Frileys is that George is sitting back here. He was instrumental. I'm sure he'll talk about this in more detail. I don't know. But anyway, uh, this is their very nice cross section. And hopefully we'll have one for the southern Puna like this soon, uh, where they show these um, low velocity anomalies. And one of the, this, the biggest one here sits right underneath the Frileys ignimbrite, which was kind of strange if the Frileys ignimbrite was five to nine million years old. And so I, I actually really like that the Frileys ignimbrite could be younger and sits right above that velocity anomaly. They also were seeing uh, uh, zones of partial melt in the lower crust, and this is also uh, the group, the German group as well. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, so that's just putting the Frileys and the other thing is that uh, we know a lot about the crustal thicknesses in this area, thanks again to the paper of UN, some work we did at Cornell with McGlashan and the work that the Arizona group did. We actually have a lot of control on the crustal thickness, and the crustal thicknesses are very high, 73, uh, 75 kilometers. This is some of the world's thickest crust. Okay, so we uh, went there and we analyzed all the samples and we uh, looked at the well, we don't have a lot of analysis, but we have some. And so we're now we're going to look at lanthanum samarium versus samarium euterbium. Remember I told you that samarium euterbium uh, is uh, most, in, in rocks of this composition, is mostly related to retention of the heavy rare earths and garnet. And uh, the modern crustal thickness is 65 to 70 kilometers, so, so the crustal thickness is going to increase in this way. And I'm going to say, well, greater than 70 or 40 to 50 at this time. Okay, so let's, let's make a story out of this. Here's the early Miocene rocks. Uh, they have uh, maybe a crustal thickness, if, if you believe this, 40 to 45. Then the crust thickens up. And this is the time of the Altiplano shortening, and thanks to Ono's group for all the information. Altiplano shortening thickens the crust. And uh, so in the mid-Miocene, we get the steepest rare patterns that have seen anywhere on Earth, practically and certainly in the Andes. Uh, we looked at, the, I showed you some diagrams before, but uh, uh, the Cerro Galan is one of the steepest, and it's down here at six. Six is high. Remember, garnet comes in here at about four. And so these are some of the steepest rare earth patterns observed. This is also important uh, because this is the time of the silver, zinc, and all of the important mineralization. Okay, so we get these extremely steep rare earth patterns. Then, if we go and look at the rocks that are 8 to 7 million years, they have much flatter rare earth patterns, much lower samarium euterbium ratios. And this is the time, according to Molnar and Garzioni, of the uplift. So I think that uh, we could have had 
some delamination. We also have to get the crust silicic. At some point, the crust becomes silicic. So if uh, I think the Arizona group has shown that it's silicic, other people. And so uh, the, uh, we're suggesting that this is possibly the time of uh, delamination, not the scale delamination they were talking about, but uh, the crust becoming more silicic. And then if we go back to the Frileys, you see what's happening. Uh, these, okay, less than five million years. The, the rare earth patterns steepen up again. This is the time of the subandean thrusting. So the thick crust maintained by crustal flow and subandean shortening. So maybe this is fiction, but it, uh, we're, we're very intrigued with this. and We're trying to get NSF to give us some money to investigate this a little more. But this, I think, maybe is a nice example of showing how you can build the geochemistry into the regional tectonic and geophysical story. And maybe it's fiction, but maybe not. OK, so this is uh, 26 to 17 million years, shallow but not flat subduction. And then we have the, the crustal thickening. Uh, thickens, and here is the Altiplano and the Cordillera Oriental thrusting. Crust thickens to at least 60, 65, maybe more, uh, related to Altiplano th crusting. Delamination. After 12 million years, uh, the magnetism accelerates. We, we start to see more magnetism. This is associated with delamination, if you believe it, and uh, deformation, and, and the magnetism, and then uh, the history developing. So, so those are uh, a work in progress, but uh, some things. OK, and then the other thing we can look at is the isotopes. And the funny thing about the isotopes here is that uh, this is just strontium isotopes versus silica content. And uh, this is the strontium isotopes, the, the little data that exists uh, for the Frileys. These are the basalts. The mafic, the mafic lavas, I pointed out those mafic lavas. But if you take the ignimbrites and put them in the middle of the uh, Puna Altiplano ignimbrites, uh, they fall about in the middle. And this is kind of funny because this is a very paraluminous crust. And so what, what this suggests to me is that we've got to be adding uh, material from the mantle. And that mantle has to be changing uh, through time. OK, so um, significant mantle contribution. And the other thing is that uh, if you look at the 87, 86 ratios, these are in the basalts. OK, so if you have a depleted mantle, I think about 703, 704, but these are 706. And these are, some of these have up to 1,600 ppm strontium in fairly mafic rocks. And so it's very, very difficult to get the strontium up uh, through crustal contamination. Contamination, And this is the story all over the Puna, all the Puna with the mafic lavas. They have high 87, 86 ratios and high strontium contents. And people talk about doing it through crustal assimilation, but it's by mass balance, it's extremely hard to do. So this is part of this evidence for uh, enriching an enriched mantle beneath the Puna Altiplano Plateau. And one way to enrich that is through delaminated lithosphere. And the other way is through subduction <coughs> erosion, which is um, we're going to go in a minute. OK, so what causes Andean shallow subduction? So I, I, I've showed you, I think, that shallow subduction is uh, really significant in the history of the deformation and the magmatism. So what causes shallow subduction? Well, one thing is subduction of a a seismic ridges. Uh, and uh, if we just look at the Nazca ridge and we look at the timing of the our steepening of the subduction zone. It actually works out, well, I'll show you another diagram, very well with the southward migration of the Juan Fernandez Ridge. We can't explain everything that way. We can't explain these synchronous magmatic flare, ma magmatic episodes. There's, there's other things that are similar. So I, I think that, I don't know, I, I really like Ono's westward drift. I guess he's going away from it. I don't think it's the only factor, but I think it, it's got to be there. The westward drift. It actually explains the magmatic or orogenic, the Quechua 1, 2, 3, 4, and all of the um, deformational phases and magmatic events that people have been talking about along the Andean margin for a long time, why they're so synchronous in time. So, so that's uh, uh, two things. OK, and then, uh, so Ono will recognize this. This is his, his uh, I just put my times of change on here. So my times of change 
our, he, he has, uh, this is his diagram, um, with uh, um, sp speeding up and slowing down and flattening. And the, the uh, big magmatic events all occur at the times of change. So I think that there's a correlation with the westward drift. But it's not the whole story. And, yeah. Well, you can, uh, we'll get Ono to explain this later. <laughs> but westward drift, basically. I mean, uh, basically, you cannot explain it, as he, as he said, by looking just at the velocity models of the NASCA um, South America interaction. So by westward drift, I mean relative to the fixed mantle. And actually, this works very well in Patagonia. There's some very nice stories on the basalts, why some of the basalts are big basaltic plateaus in the back arc you can explain very nicely by considering westward drift. So I think it's actually a factor. Okay, and then this is just uh, to going back to the uh, Nazca plate migrating south. Okay, and uh, all I've done here is that this is the plate model of, I didn't write it down, but Yanyas et al. 2001. They reconstructed the motion of the uh, Juan Fernandez Ridge, and this goes up in time like this and then comes around. And uh, what, what these circles here, pink circles, are the ignimbrites. And uh, this is just a constant place. And so uh, the most important thing to see here is that the, so the, the ridge is up here. It's migrating south, migrating south. And after it passes to the south, the ignimbrites pop up. So here's the ridge pa passing off to the south, and here's the ignimbrites popping up. So there's actually, I was really surprised at this. There's a good correlation of the time that the ridge is just passed when the ignimbrites start to pop up. And so this is consistent with shallowing of the subducting plate by the Juan Fernandez Ridge, and then after it passes through, it steepens up. And when it steepens up, those ignimbrites pop up. Okay, I have 15 minutes left to talk about four arc subduction erosion. Okay, so you notice here that I put a box and I put four arc subduction erosion. We haven't talked about it out here yet, but uh, those of you who are not familiar with subduction erosion, this is from a cartoon in Von Huni et al. This would be uh, down to only about 25, 30 kilometers. And Ono's done a lot of some of the really nice work on uh, the subduction channel in the Alps. He actually sees it. <laughs> uh, so just peeling off essentially the underside of the continent. So the question is, what happens to this? I think everybody agrees this is happening to some degree because uh, there's lots of geophysical images. There's lot the, we, we see the migration of the arc. Um, so removing the fore arc. And removing the four arc crust, removing the four arc lithosphere. And uh, so then this is taking it down to greater depth. So what, what happens at depth? And so uh, we're going to have to look at what's going on out here and uh, moving it down. And the question is, does any of this material get up into the magmatic signature? And we're beginning to see evidence that it does. And I think that other people have, uh, are also. So this is just uh, shows the, Ono talked about this. I won't spend much time on this. But the uh, um, Andean arc in the Mesozoic migrated eastward. So this is some of this evidence for 220 kilometers of uh, eastward arc migration. And if you think that the trench arc gap has to maintain some reasonable distance, the only way to explain it is that you have to have removed the four arc. People used to think that you could strike, slip it away, but nobody can find it, and I don't think anybody believes that anymore. OK, this is from a paper from Michael Hauske. Um, and he, he actually did this at Cornell, the chemistry. But uh, he, he looked at the chemistry uh, in each one of these. And, and uh, so this is uh, what's happening, and then the arc moves. So every time the, the arc is stationary, the lanthanum euterbium ratio grows, the strontium isotope ratio grows, and it reaches a maximum just before the arc migrates. So this is the first arc migration, second arc migration, third arc migration. So you see this pattern of steepening rare earth patterns and increasing strontium and decreasing neodymium, like you're putting a pulse of continental 
crustal material into the magma source when the crust migrates. Now, you can argue that this is thickening crust, and actually, Hauske didn't use a thorax subduction erosion model. He had the crust thickening and delaminating, thickening and delaminating, thickening and delaminating. And I think, I don't think the crust bobs up and down quite that much, but th that you can explain this better, that the signal that he's seeing here is actually the signal of thorax subduction erosion. Okay, so we're going to look at then two profiles, one just south of the flat slab here and one north of the flat slab. So this is the flat slab, and uh, the, so we'll look at Teniente and then we'll look at Copia Paul, the two for two. And uh, this then is the one at 34 degrees south. And uh, what we see here is the arc front migrates. And now we're not talking about the Cretaceous, we're talking about the Miocene. And so the arc front migrates 35 kilometers at 19 to 6 million years, and it migrates another 50 kilometers at 7 to 4 million years. So uh, when we go further south, you lose this arc migration. It's really just on the borders of the flat slab. So uh, 50 kilometers of arc migration, essentially between 7 and 4 million years. Keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that. We're going to see it does the same thing in the north, and we're going to argue it does not in the flat slab. OK, now let's look at the uh, chemical signatures. This is the lanthanum euterbium ratio. And uh, this is versus time on the top. So the first arc migration was at this time. Look what happens to the lanthanum terbium ratios. So they go up, goes across, and uh, here's the second arc migration. So when the arc migrates, we see these high lanthanum terbium garnets coming into the system. Where's that garnet? Is in the lower crust? Is it coming out of four arc subduction erosion? But wh whatever it is, we're seeing this garnet signature. The other thing. This is the isotopes, and I plotted this versus silica. And this is important because this shows that this is not a function of increasing silica content. This is at the same silica content. So these are real jumps in the source. Uh, so the, we have a, a jump at, during the time of arc migration, a jump during the time of arc migration. So what's causing that? And like Ono said, uh, we've done mass balance in this region as well. And uh, if the arc has migrated like this, it says there's a lot of material been removed, but we don't need it in the mass balance. We can make the crust thick. We can do everything we need to do without it. So it's got to be going somewhere. And so the question is whether uh, it's going down, but it's leaving sniffs. And these sniffs are these. And uh, Kai Hernley um, from Kiel recently told me that they did oxygen isotopes on some of the rocks in the main arc with uh, these here. And uh, people were saying it was all crustal contamination, but they're finding oxygen, a lot of mantle oxygen isotope signatures. So they're starting to think that there's much more subduction erosion involved in those components as well. OK, uh, let's go now up to the north side. OK, here's the flat slab here. Here's the north side of the flat slab. And uh, I had to show at least one result from our uh, seismic array. We've been working on the earthquakes. This is the stuff the Arizona has done. Uh, but uh, the, the, if you look at the old Isaacs and Cahill and Isaacs contours, there's a broad transition zone here. And uh, this is the Bonete. These are the last quaternary uh, volcanoes in the southern volcanic zone. And they were just sitting out over the flat slab. But if you look at our revised flat slab contours, the slab contours now bend just where we end at the, uh, um, these young quaternary centers. And more important than that, um, we're going to look at what's called the glassy, plagioclase free, percus nigris, mafic, andesitic, I hate this word, adekite lavas that erupted between 8 and 3 million years as the arc front was displaced 50 kilometers into the floor arc on the north side of the flat slab. And where this is happening, where, where, where these Perkis Negers rocks are erupting is right over the bend, right here. And we know we can date. The, so we think that that bend formed between 8 and 3 million years ago and it is associated with the arc migration. I still have a few minutes. OK, so this is just the lanthanum terbium ratio I showed you on the other ones. OK, this is the, the normal arc. Uh, and this is the time of transition. The ratio goes up. And this is back to today. So you can't just relate this to crustal thickness, because 
unless you think the crust thickened and blobbed off, but we know the crustal thickness is 70 kilometers today, and we still have not as steep as rare earth patterns. So there was a transient event in here in which those rare earth patterns became very steep, and it was transient, and it's in these, again, very glassy rocks. The other thing that's unusual about these rocks is they have high chrome contents. So where did that chrome come from? So what we're suggesting is that these high, steep uh, lanthanum euterbium ratios actually reflect not just melting of the lower crust, but melting of crust that was removed from the four arc margin. And in this case, it's very nice. It's mafic crust. It's the mafic uh, Mesozoic crust. And it would make very nice eclogite. And uh, it then mixes into the arc magmatic source. And so these high chrome and nickel contents are reflecting this mantle participation. And uh, the other thing that happens is, uh, just like Kowski showed, there's a jump in strontium isotopes. These are the rocks pre-migration. This is post-migration. This is strontium isotope. And again, the important thing here is that it's independent of silica content. So something came in, put a pulse into the source of that magmatism. And it doesn't look like it's just thickened crust. There are, the crust here is very thick as well, and that always makes it difficult. But there's a pulse on top of that. And then the coup de gras, I guess, is the mafic magmas. And uh, OK, so this is the arc 27 to 6 million years. Then the arc migrates eastward. And we were very lucky to find primitive basalts of 24 million years and 2 million years age. And Cintil, uh appreciate this. They have more than 9% magnesium, more than 600 ppm chrome. They're very nickel rich. They have FO8889 olivines. These are mantle-derived rocks. So, so the question is, uh, what are their isotopic signatures? Is there any change through time? And in terms of time, I think I'll skip that. But, but uh, OK, so the um, 24 million year old rocks have strontium isotopic signatures of 7038. The um, young ones, the, the 2 million years, are 705. So we got to go from 7038 to 705. And uh, this is going to be very difficult to do by crustal contamination because not only do these lavas have six and 700 ppm uh, strontium, they are also very primitive. And so you can't stick uh, much crust in there. So there is some crustal contamination then superimposed on the magmas in the region. So our model, and this is uh, also very important that we have oxygen data. And uh, we strip out this crustal component. And so we get down to what we think the mantle was. And so we can get back to a mantle oxygen value. And so, not, so at a mantle oxygen value, we're going from 7038 to 705 between uh, 24 and 2 million years, which we don't have any time control there, but we think that the arc migrated between 8 and 3 million years. And so I think that's some of the best evidence around for source contamination, that that contamination is actually happening in the mantle. OK, so origin of the rich components in these CVZ lavas can't be sediments. There's no set of continental shed detritus after 11 million years. And uh, you can talk about pelagic sediments being subducted. But look, come on, the Andean margins have been the same for a zillion years. And it's had a constant pelagic source. So all the magmas are seeing the same pelagic source. Can't be an older metasomatized mantle. It's ruled out by the contrast. And in situ contamination alone is inconsistent with the chemistry of the primitive lavas. So contamination of the mantle source with crust removed by four arc subduction erosion, followed by various degrees of crustal assimilation. And uh, OK, so then this would be uh, the model. And uh, we're in the process of writing a paper. Uh, we've looked at what the uh, composition of the uh, best ideas of the composition of the continental margin. We've actually calculated based on 50 kilometers of arc migration and making assumptions about the slab shape that uh, we come up with a, a loss rate, at least in this transect, of 124 cubic kilometers per million years per 
per kilometer of four arc over eight million years. If it happened over eight to three million years, it's even faster. So people talk about four arc subduction erosion, but I think four arc subduction erosion is very episodic. You see pulses going in when you see the arc migrate. And so you, people talk about long-term rates, but you've got to be careful looking at long-term rates because it seems like, and then I finish up with this. Okay, this is a little complicated, but we've just talked about the central volcanic zone, the southern volcanic zone. We showed that there were 50 kilometers of arc migration between uh, 8 and 3 million years on both sides of the flat slab. But what about in the flat slab itself? There's no magmatic arc, so we can't track the magmatic arc. But we can draw a dashed line through here where we think that magmatic arc should be if we just connect up the central volcanic zone with the sun. Uh, southern volcanic zone. It's very interesting. It goes through a, a huge valley called the Kalangasta Valley. Why is the Kalangasta Valley there? Well, it's a terrain suture. People make a lot about the terrain suture, but for me, it's just as important as that's where the volcanic arc should be. Okay, so now let's just uh, play some games. Let's measure the arc trench gap. So the arc trench gap along most of the Andes is 300 kilometers. It's in the southern volcanic zone, the, arc, the trench bends, but the arc trench gap remains about 30, 300 kilometers. You can go up into Bolivia, the arc trench gap is 300 kilometers. Okay, so that, and that's to the modern arc. We've said that in the northern part and the southern part, it's migrated uh, 50 kilometers over the 40 to 50 kilometers east. Uh, and so, that's the, and actually uh, the, the Miocene front was pretty much where the Eocene front was. So, so from the late Miocene, it's, it's migrated 50 kilometers. Okay, so let's look where this extinct uh, Miocene to Eocene arc is. Well, it's 260 kilometers from the trench. And it's 260 kilometers from the Chile and from the Chile trench over the flat slab too. And what's 300 kilometers from the trench is the, uh, Kalangasta Valley, where we think the arc should be. So, if you put all of that together, uh, this non-existent volcanic arc should have been displaced 40 to 50 kilometers eastward between eight and three million years ago. And, oops. Okay, so this is back to the Arizona group, the paper by Wagner et al. And they see uh, this low VP, high VPVS, or low VPVS and high VS in the metal wedge under the flat slab. And uh, in their latest scenarios, it's, a, it's attributed to an orthopyroxene buried mantle formed during shallow subduction with silica introduced by sediment subduction. Well, I would suggest that uh, maybe the peak flat slab shallowing occurred after 10 million years, then the arc migrated to the north and the south, and it's consistent, it's consistent with a major flux of material removed by four arc subduction erosion introduced into the flat slab between eight and three million years ago, and the uh, erosion rate would be the same as to the north and the south. So those are just some wild ideas, but I, I really think it's kind of neat that it worked out that way. Okay, so how did the mantle get enriched? The mantle got enriched by addition of crustal lithosphere into the mantle by four arc subduction erosion and delamination. And uh, I guess I'll just uh, finish up. Gonna, the conclusions are here. I went over them at the beginning, so I should be finishing up. But transient, I think that shallow subduction plays an important role. I think that westward drift plays a role. I think the four arc subduction erosion is a process that's far more important that people are just beginning to realize the importance of it. The Andes is a, is a model of destruction rather than creation of continental crust. We can do it by delamination. We can do it by four arc subduction erosion. We can explain the ignimbrites. And we can show that uh, Ono's right, you've got to have material coming in from the west. You're not going to do this by magmatism. But the magmatism is important because it's bringing the heat. And it, this, is, this is what that ductile layer is. And this, it's this ductile lower crust. And all of this action going into the mantle uh, above the asthenosphere that's driving the system. Do you have any quick questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering to um, interpret your geotechnical data how, um, and, and the 
dynamic story. How are you dependent on you know, the uh, corner flow model that basically doesn't hold if the trench is moving or if the flow line is in the mantle or not landing in your side? I'm not worried about I'm not using the corner flow model ex to the extent that. Uh, but for, your, for the organic, for example, you need temperature, temperature yeah. data, right? And you need, so you need somehow a dynamic model to have this. So, and do you use it to do your for example? Well, I mean, the arc magnetism is happening, so uh, I, I'm actually haven't worried that much. We wrote a paper, The Illusions, in 1994, where we actually turned the, the corner flow around because we thought it made more sense. And there were some people at Caltech doing the same thing. But after that, everybody told us we didn't understand anything about magnetism. So I don't know about corner flow. I mean, I don't think we understand the flow in the wedge that well. But it doesn't affect the, this much because all I need is the melting, the magmas to melt, and the, and the magmas to rise. It, it doesn't. Be because it's a geometrical question. It, it, I mean, it, you know, that's important if you want to understand the whole dynamics of the system, but in terms of just mass balance, it doesn't matter very much. I see you, you were doing the decompression melting. I'm just wondering, I didn't see flux melting on there or anything really special. Well, it could be flux melting, yeah. I mean, yeah, no, the, it's obvious the fluids are important. And I, you know, I mean, you can only say so much in a talk, but why do you get eclogite at the base of the crust? Well, eclogite, you know, there's all sorts of kinetic problems with producing eclogite, and having a shallow subduction zone actually happens, helps a lot because you can get fluids that, that, cause, that cause the eclogite, help, help promote the eclogite transition. So, so not only is a shallow subduction good for uh, thickening the crust, it's also good for, for creating uh, the kinematic problems of the eclogite. So yeah, you no, know, the, there's flux melting. I mean, there's certainly there's slab fluids, fluids coming off the slab. But the idea is you're steepening it up, and so you're increasing the mantle volume. So I think that, I think that decompression melting is the most important. I'm not saying it's the only thing. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I mean, you, you could, I mean, particularly if you want to put a lot of serpentine down there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we could go back and talk about barium lanthanum ratios. The barium lanthanum ratios are low in most of the back arc rocks. The arc signature is there, the high field strength element. But if you, if you relate barium, barium lanthanum to fluids, there, there's not very much fluid coming off the slab by the time you get back there if, you look at, if you're just looking at barium fluxes. But 